Hey, Paloma, I see you there in the audience. Thanks, folks. As you're starting to log in, we're going to wait for um, Darby to sign on. And we'll give a few moments for Darby to join. But my name's Olivia Amaya Ortiz. I'm a former educator at the School for Advanced Research's Indian Arts Research Center. And I will be facilitating some conversations on our SAR Artist Live series. Um, this series is for viewers to jump behind the scenes and the workspaces of some really talented artists, which tonight includes Darby Raymond over street. Um, I do want to mention that this program is funded by the City of Santa Fe Arts and Culture Department and the 1% Lodgers Tax. And I also want to say that I'm joined by Chelsea Ferrara. Chelsea, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, can everyone, can you hear me okay there? Oh, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm really excited to, to be joined with you again. Uh, last month, we had our first Artist Live series. Um, I'm joining you all from Tucson, Arizona. I'm the Curator of Community Engagement at the University of Arizona Museum of Art. Um, and we are just so excited to partner with the School for Advanced Research on these um, Artists Live uh, speaker series. It's been like just a very cool way to introduce all of our museum audiences and followers here in Arizona to all the incredible work that the School for Advanced Research has done in supporting, supporting artists. Um, yeah, and this, and this uh, artist live series, um, we're really excited to be featuring Danae Textiles and Weavings. Uh, and this is actually in conjunction with our upcoming exhibition at the UA Museum of Art. Uh, we're very excited. It's going to be opening soon, opening in October of this year called Pulse, uh, Weavings and Paintings by Marlo Catoni. And this exhibition is going to feature recent weavings and paintings by the artists. Um, we're really excited to showcase the ways in which uh, each medium can influence each other. So thank you so much for having us join yeah, And Marlo Catoni is also um, a former artist fellow from SAR. He was the 2015 Rollin and Mary Ella King Native Artist Fellow. So SAR is also just really excited to see um, where his career is taken off and we're excited for this exhibition. Um, and yeah, we can, we can get started tonight with Darby. Um, so Darby is an award-winning Diné digital artist and printmaker. Um, through her work, she, uh, she studies and creates Diné patterns that materialize in the form of portraits, landscapes, um, abstract forms, and her work is heavily inspired by and derived from traditional Diné textiles with particular interest in pieces that date um, from around the late 1800s to the 1950s. And you may have seen some of her work in the past um, in exhibitions such as at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the Museum of Northern Arizona in Flagstaff, Arizona, um, and Gallery Hoja in Albuquerque, New Mexico. That's just to name a few. She's also um, received recognition and awards at multiple uh, multiple places such as the Idle York Market and Swaya Santa Fe Indian Market. Um, so with that being said, Darby, thanks for joining us. I'm happy to see you. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself in your own words? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, thank you for that awesome introduction. I feel like there's not a ton to say after that. Um, but uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Darby. And uh, originally, I'm from uh, Flagstaff, Arizona. That's where I went to school and grew up and whatnot. And um, yeah, right now I'm based in uh, Chimayo, New Mexico, just north of Santa Fe, about 20 or 30 miles. But uh, I'm really grateful to be here. And uh, I've been looking forward to diving into this conversation. So thank you for having me. We're so excited. Thank you so much. Um, well, yeah. 
I guess we can just kind of jump in. As uh, Olivia mentioned in the introduction, you are um, definitely heavily influenced by the history of Navajo weaving. Um, can you tell us a little bit more in detail um, for some of our audience members how the history of Navajo weaving has has directly influenced your work? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, in looking at the history of weaving, I mean, it's significantly um, important and uh, certainly influential in the work that I do. Uh, I would say that the, sorry, I had a notification come up on my phone. Um, uh, it's especially so with the portraiture that I do, which is um, really the foundation in my journey as an artist, uh, certainly so on this kind of trajectory that I'm on right now. And in that body of work, I portray contemporary Diné in the visual language of our weaving tradition. And um, as Olivia mentioned, I'm working with these historic pieces that are coming from like the mid to late 1800s up to the 1950s. And um, I implement them in a digital collage process. And essentially, you know, the whole idea behind the portraits is that it's like the people I'm portraying are made up of these weavings. They're made up of these different motifs. And um, yeah, they they themselves are woven. And uh, the work is really an homage to the weaving tradition itself, but um, also to weavers themselves. And especially so those weavers who, um, through history, you know, we can observe that they were really able to adapt this uh, tradition to the shifts that were occurring, uh, that were really propelled by uh, colonizer uh, values and ideals. and. You can just really observe how these weaving or how these weavers were able to use this tradition as this like tool of agency in these really challenging and difficult times. And so um, I examine that history in my work a lot and I um, certainly reflect on that a lot. And, uh, you know, like for example, I uh, looking at pieces that come out of like say Bosque Redondo when our ancestors were uh, interned in that area and it's really you know like the the darkest moment i think in our collective history um just in that there was so much suffering there was a lot of um sickness and loss of life and the conditions there were just um i mean absolutely horrible just such a a bleak moment in time and um uh in looking at that moment, you know, we see that there's weavings that also come out of that time. And I think of one piece in particular that I, I was able to see in Moifa's collection. And it's this piece that um, Linda Teller, Pete, she is the one who um, kind of specified that this is uh, the time period in the era that that piece came out of. And it, I would I wish I could show you a picture, not that pictures would really do it justice because it's just this incredible piece. It's, I don't know what the count is, but it's incredibly finely woven and the designs of it are just um, wowing. Like it's just so completely intricate and the use of color is just an incredible piece. And to think that something that beautiful and that um, finely crafted could come out of this kind of moment in time, I think just speaks to how important weaving is and has been to our people. And um, yeah, has definitely served as this kind of mode of um, survival and survivance and just getting through challenges. And um, I see that piece kind of specifically as this example of how, um, you know, in, through like a creative process like weaving, you're really able to um, put a lot of yourself into these pieces. You put um, kind of like your experiences, but you also put your aspirations and uh, your values and your hopes and your dreams and um, all of these things. And just seeing how weaving was used to get through that really difficult time, I think is just monumental. And it can be seen just uh, throughout time how uh, weavers were able to kind of adapt and use this uh, tradition as a means of agency like afterwards when um, our people were allowed to return to a portion uh, of Diné lands, um, 
they were returning to uh, an environment that had been the victim of a scorched earth policy, right? So there's really a lot of um, kind of starting over and building, uh, building up from the ground up in that sense, but then also this in the sense of like building community again. And so the weavings that we see that also come out of this era, I think are really um, incredible. A lot of beautiful uh, utilitarian pieces, um, clothing and um, just, you know, these these really uh, meaningful pieces that just show how this tradition is used to um, keep on moving forward in a lot of ways through these challenges. And then of course, um, as it was adapted to the kind of trade era in the Southwest with the implementation of uh, trading posts, you know, we see those taking root and kind of getting established and it creates this circumstance where it's this kind of imposed participation into the American economy. And so people are now weaving to um, put food on the table, essentially. They're creating these pieces and selling them to the trading post to get credits, to just kind of get these basic essential needs um, out of that situation. And so, yeah, just looking at these kind of different instances, um, I really feel that uh, we current generations are essentially here because of the um, choices that our ancestors made, the intentions that they set forth, and um, just the fortitude and perseverance that they had. Uh, they created um, a path to a way forward, and we're here today and um, able to take um, advantage of that opportunity. And so, in effect, you know, the idea behind the portraits is that we um, have been woven into the uh, cultural fabric that is Diné. That's um, that's Diné existence and Diné resistance. And um, so, yeah, history is a huge facet of the work that I'm doing, and also seeing it as a continuum, right? Like seeing that we're a part of that, uh, we're a continuation of that history. That that legacy is really a part of um, us and who we are and kind of the situations that we're in now. And it just, it really speaks to the importance of the decisions that you make and the choices that you make, you know, those have a, those can have a pretty profound impact down the line. And so, uh, yeah. I don't, I don't have any follow-up questions for you. That was fantastic. That was I want to remind folks powerful. that, um, they're, they're welcome to use the comment box and send emojis and all of that feedback. We welcome um, all of that. I think that was a really rich answer. And there's so many different avenues we can explore from there. I think for me, one thing that came up is you're talking about accessing um, some of these historic pieces, which it sounds like you're maybe working within museum collections. And I know that you were recently an advisor for the exhibition that is on view at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. If folks are unfamiliar with this exhibition. It's called Horizons, um, Weaving Between the Lines. And maybe you could just share with us a little bit more the experience that you had as a collaborator on that on that project, working with those pieces. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that Working on that, that exhibition, um, participating in the capacity as being a Diné advisory um, or being on that committee, uh, that was just such a unique experience and really a special experience. And um, I think that the involvement that we each had, um, we being myself, uh, Linda, Linda Teller, Pete, uh, Terrell Tapaha, Kevin Aspis, and Larissa Nez, and then of course also Raphael Begay, who is the co-curator alongside Hadley. The involvement that we had through the whole process was just incredible. Like we were there um, pretty much in all of the important decision making um, portions of putting that show together, and um, that was incredibly valuable that they gave us this opportunity to visit the collections. Uh, we visited Mayak's collections and then uh, Moifo was gener uh, Museum of International Folk Art, Folk Art <laughs> was generous enough to also let us uh, view pieces in their collection. Um, 
but uh, it, through that process, you know, we were able to just really dive deep and have really meaningful conversations and really kind of parse out exactly the, t the types of conversations that we wanted the exhibition to, um, to uh, uh, spark and kind of the themes that we wanted to illuminate. And um, I don't think, I can't imagine um, <laughs> being able to do that, have, having not having access to those collections because we did do like virtual convenings too, but they were always based off of um, the convenings that we had in person, in collections, looking at pieces, really um, being able to interact with them, hold them, feel them. And then um, just, you know. That those folks had to share with us. Did I drop out? For a second. Okay. Are you saying that you were able to hold them? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, we were able to, um, you know, be interacting with these pieces that were, were eventually um, chosen to be in the exhibition. And it was really just a collaborative effort um, with us and with the with MIAC. And um, I think it made for just a really unique, uh, a unique show in that our voices are really present and really centered. Um, if you see the show, our, we really did a lot of the um, language with the labels, uh, mostly the other advisory committees. I had like one or two things, my two cents in there, but um, I, I helped out a lot with the 2D graphic design and kind of um, participated in that, to that extent as well. But um, yeah, it was just a, a really unique experience. Fantastic. Um... So in the introduction, uh, it was noted that you work in just so many different mediums. It's so broad and different dimensions too, right? Like 2D, 3D, um, you're working in like dimensional or uh, digital printmaking, weaving, mixed media, um, even applying woodwork and inlay into your practice. Um, and I'm really curious what your thoughts are on how each of these inform each other. Um, but, and even more specifically, like for you, is there a connection um, between the traditional Diné textiles and uh, photography? Um, okay, yeah, so I think for me, I think that um, when I'm in the studio creating, um, I work on all these projects kind of simultaneously. I'll do digital work and then I'll do like printmaking and um, everything's kind of at different stages, so everything's happening at once, and uh, it certainly looks like everything's happening at once in there and when I'm working. Um, but just by nature of creating in that way, I think that the works really do inform each other in that um, my approach in a lot of ways is kind of um, one of like problem solving, um, trying to figure out the most effective way to achieve a goal, whether it be digitally or through uh, printmaking or in woodworking. And um, I think that having that approach really enables me to kind of have this um, uh, kind of constant open mind and like learning. And it's interesting, I guess, in that mistakes, of course, come up, but sometimes those mistakes in that project seem like they are relevant or a possible solution in another project. And um, so in that way, this conversation is happening uh, between the works, which is fun, but it's really just kind of uh, my playground in a sense where I'm just kind of figuring things out as I go and um, hoping for the best and just trying my best to make uh, the work as good as it can be. And as far as the relationship between um, weaving and photography, I think that there there's a, a lot of overlap between the two in that they are uh, both place-based, right? Um, especially like traditional weaving as it relates to um, the lifestyle of caring for sheep and, um, you know, uh, collecting plants for dyes and then weaving uh, within that region where you're have your family and are living. That's very site specific, and a lot of um, site specific 
cultural and traditional knowledge goes into that process. And then um, <clears throat> as it relates to photography, that's also site specific, right? Like you, you can only take the, a specific photograph in a certain place. And um, bo in both uh, art forms, you know, it's really uh, engaging land and this relationship with art and the person who's involved in the process. And so um, I think in that way, in that they're uh, site specific art forms, that's how they're, there's a lot of overlap there. I love that parallel. I think it's I, I hadn't thought about that before, personally. I think it's easy to become really um, set on certain uh, uh, materials that, you know, what is traditional, what is contemporary, but understanding that you're really working with them in similar ways, it's really beautiful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know that your, um, your great-grandmother was a weaver, and your father's also a graphite illustrator, so I almost wonder how much of the way that they work with materials has influenced you um, in your practice today. I don't know if you see any similarities there, generational. Um, I mean, possibly. I feel like there's definitely kind of like they've impressed upon me, like, um, I guess the like lifestyle and like relationship to creating art. Um, and I mean, I guess like like my first memories really are of uh, approaching my dad when I was like just a small like baby girl like seeing what he's up to and he's sitting at his table like drafting these crazy um, amazing intricate renderings and like in my mind I'm like my mind is blown it's still really impressive to look at I think but at the time you know I can barely like hold a crayon properly and here he's making this incredible um, portrait and that certainly like instilled within me that kind of um, desire to make and to create and to really just dive into your work. And it's this bond that me and my dad have now. Um, we really uh, kind of resonate on work, on artwork a lot. And um, it's just been kind of this present thing throughout my life. And I'm really grateful for that relationship. And but really just like his, his approach to his work was just making something because he wanted to make something like cool and awesome and beautiful. And he did a lot of work. Um, like he never sold his work. He just made stuff for um, family basically and for himself. And it's just crazy to me that he has such talent, but he's like so low key and casual about it. And here I am exposing his artistic talent to everybody all the time. Um, but that's been really meaningful uh, to me and just, you know, my relationship to my work, like, why am I making things? Um, it doesn't always have to be to sell. It can be just for yourself or it can be for your community and your family. Um, those are really uh, Im important aspects of making work for me. And then uh, my my great grandma, yeah, she was a weaver. She, I mean, that's who she was. She did every aspect of the process and um, you know she took care of her family with her weavings um, she has always had something on the loom and when she wasn't weaving she was like making jewelry so she was like totally an artist in my mind and um, that's just uh, really like how she uh, lived her life and she passed on when I was still pretty small so I didn't get to know her as well as I would have liked to but um, her presence has definitely felt just throughout my life because um, she didn't she didn't make uh, things just to sell or take to the trading post. She also made things to gift to people, and so in my family we are fortunate enough to have some of her weavings. And so I grew up, uh, you know, looking at her her pieces, and so I have this association of just um, like family and love and care and community and gathering that's associated um, with her work. And so um, that's been uh, that's been really important, I think, in my approach into, you know, looking into the history and then also kind of like addressing uh, things like appropriation, like investigating um, those feelings of like what what's going on here? Like, why does this um, like why does appropriation? Why is it not cool on so many levels? Right. Um, but yeah, both of them have been uh, massively influential, I think, in just my uh, my starting as an artist, but then also, you know, how I approach my work and um, how I cultivate this relationship that I have with creating. It's 
so uh, powerful and inspirational to hear you talk so much about um, how the past continues to influence you, but you also mentioned, you know, there's this, uh, this continuation, this lineage into the future. So uh, I'm curious what your, what your thoughts are on um, what is the future for Indigenous art? Mm. Oh, that's such a big question. Like, <laughs> who knows, right? <laughs> it's what we oh, make it. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think that uh, the future is, it's its so much based on like our experiences and our perceptions of what we're going through and kind of what um, is important to us, what we want to, um, what we want our um, future to be, our dreams and our hopes. And I think um, Indigenous art, I mean, for me, certainly, I'm thinking so much about the environment and like the global climate crisis and uh you know how are we gonna pivot how are we gonna adjust like what 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 choices are we gonna make um and you know kind of what what do we want our future to be in that regard but um i think for just also in general with indigenous art i think there's a big movement to kind of really hold dear like the the traditional values and knowledge that we have or that we can learn while our um, older generations are still here with us you know um there's kind of this uh pressure i think for on us to really take ownership over um doing what we can in order to uh, make a better future for generations that come after us and i think uh kind of a, kind of as a bridge between like past and future like we're in the present right now and so we have a big responsibility in that regard and so um as far as perpetuating traditional traditional knowledge and culture i think that's going to be um certainly a huge aspect of what what comes of um the future as it relates to art thank you i know we're running out of time i think just before i let you go i have to ask because you did mention um you know the topic of appropriation and i think your work with rumpel would be just really interesting to hear about if if you can tell us a little bit about that and how it relates to appropriation or not in this case uh yeah um, <clears throat> excuse me that was a really interesting um collaboration because um i think i mean it's it didn't direct relate to this but I think that eighth generation that company really put kind of the pressure on a lot of these um, outdoor companies blanket companies to really uh, re-examine you know what they're doing as it relates to appropriation and kind of you know it, they created this culture where people are feeling compelled to call out companies when they're doing things like just the other day I saw on Instagram or maybe it was yesterday even I saw on Instagram there was like some crazy appropriated bag that's floating around yeah yeah so I mean, it's like it happens but we have to hold them accountable so i really um i commend you know eighth gen for kind of setting the tone on that and so rumpel uh reached out to collaborate with uh well first they reached out to jordan and craig and um, me and jordan went to school together so she reached out to me and was like hey these guys are trying to you know they want to collab they um they want to kind of rectify the situation, I guess. And when I talked to them, it it did come across that way is that they were um, acknowledging that they had misstepped in the past and that they had made designs that were wholly appropriative, um, but that they wanted to move forward in a different way and kind of try to do something different and establish relationship with Native artists. And so we were like the first cohort of this uh, collaboration that they've continued with other artists and um i thought that was cool and it was um, a really great first step but it was like interesting because it was like their first time doing that but then also my first because i was like a young artist and so we were navigating the situation and um i think you know i think it was a, a good start sounds like it i'm sure you know probably a lot of burden and pressure too being the first kind of um group of artists that they work with but it's really awesome to hear about and I think um, it just goes to show how versatile you are as an artist that we see your designs and your work taking so many different forms. Um, with, with that being lots of problems. out of time, Chelsea, have anything else? No, thank, thank you sure. so much, Darby, for spending the evening with us. It was fantastic to hear more about your work and your process and 
Um, I hope lots of people give you a, a follow and uh, you're going to be making some incredible things in the future, I know. Oh, thank you both so much. Thank you. Um, before we head out, do you want to let folks know where they can um, find your work or follow you, anything like that? If you want to drop some handles? Um, yeah, uh, you can follow me at, on Instagram at darby.r.overstreet. And um, I think everybody should definitely go check out the Horizons exhibition at MIAC right now. Um, uh, definitely go see that. I have some of my work in that show too, but just go see it. It's amazing. Oops, my car. Yeah, I'm, I actually still haven't gone. So uh, I, need to, I need to get my butt up there. I'm kind of guilty of that. Um, all right. So uh, we'll call this the night. Thank you so much, Darby. We're going to do another segment of um, Artists Live with a focus on Danae Textiles and Weaving. Our next segment will be with Marlo Pichoni. Um, super excited for that. So make sure to keep an eye on our social media, on SAR's calendar. Um, if you want to stay up to date with all of the happenings and awesome programming going on um, with Everyone same, have the same over here at the UM Museum of Art. Keep, and we'll uh, share more on when that, that session is going to be. Thank you, Darby, so much. Everyone, thank you for joining us.